Welcome and good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bhatt from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. In an era of mantras and clarion calls, the one which is not only important, but also a motivator to generations of professionals in India is Startup India. Aerospace and defense are arenas which have not been left untouched, but in fact are somewhat trailblazers for all this call of the government. And today we have with us someone who wrote a success story with not only creating a startup, but giving it a focus of defense and security and also getting applause for itself. We have with us Dr. Shivaraman Ramaswamy, the co-founder of Big Bang Boom, the defense startup, which is the talk of the town. Welcome, sir, to the ADS chat room. And to take the discussion forward and to know about the company more, we have with us editor Sangeeta Saxena, Aviation and Defense Universe. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Itali. Just wonderful, uh, Dr. Shiva, to have you with us. It's a real honor because, uh, you know, when Prime Minister started this clarion call of Startup India, we really were wondering how it would progress. How many would come ahead and say, yes, we want to start something. We want to start something focused. We want to start something on aerospace and defense. And when we heard of you, when we heard of your awards, you won for the IDEX and you know, it was wonderful actually. And uh, this is an opportunity we really like to take to put the message across to all our audiences that look, India is moving ahead. I'm very sure that after Israel, in the last five years, ours is a country which is number two in startups. And uh, welcome to the show, sir. It's wonderful to have you here. Let's go ahead with it. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, it's a great honor to be here. I mean, we, we are a very young startup. We've been working on this defense field for the last uh, two, three years now. And uh, we are very happy to get this kind of recognition and being able to be part of such a conversation here. Oh, wonderful, Dr. Shiva. That's really great. And what I wanted to understand is my first question, which I think <laughs> everybody wants to know, big bang, boom. Now, what? how did this come into your mind? What does it represent? You know, it's really it's all eager to know that. Absolutely. So uh, typically, if you look at it, Big Bang Boom represents the start of the universe, right? It's it's basically the, the event that kickstarted everything that uh, currently exists. So when we were starting the company, we were we had two things in mind. One, we, we realized we were starting something new and something. At that time, we were looking at uh, doing very, very high-tech uh, intellectual property creation in India in the defense space, which was not really spoken about or not not really the focus of anyone. So we believe this was a startup, something new. And we were very clear from day one that we wanted to be a defense startup. So we wanted the name to uh, be synonymous with that. We wanted the name to mean, or when people first heard the name, they should they should be able to pick it up from the name itself that we are a, a defense company. And with Boom as a part of it, I think it was very exciting. I think the, the, uh, the good part that has happened is that it's become a fantastic icebreaker. Uh, right from the defense minister, right down to the uh, smallest of the, you know, uh, employees who is joining us. Uh, you know, everyone, one of the first questions that they ask is about the name. Uh, suddenly a very formal conversation becomes very casual and uh, we get off to a great start. And it also, now it has also become a very catchy phrase. So uh, in the sense that there is a lot of uh, power of recall with it. There are not a lot of companies with these kind of uh, defense. So people remember the name. And even recently, when I had met one of the very senior gentlemen in the armed forces, uh, he, he was like, haven't I met you somewhere before? And we had, we had met around three years back. I said, yes, sir, I'm Dr. Shiva. He's like, ah. And I said, sir, from Big Bang Home. He's like, ah, now I know you. Right. So, so you know, the name, the company's name has started, you know, becoming the most popular thing. And that's fantastic for our brand. So we are very excited. And I'll tell you one thing, which is just added information to you, which is that, uh, you know, I was very recently at Singapore Air Show and somebody there in one of the, uh, you know, OEMs with manufacturers, aircrafts, they wanted to know, you know, there's a company in India which is going to make booms. 
So I said, oh, is it? I didn't know. And then I realized they were talking about you. So I just gave them a little introduction because I knew from the list and I knew from IDEX about you. So I said, no, no, they're not planning to make booms. Could be they make sometimes in the future, you know, when they grow up and they become big enough. So it's very, it's actually nice, you know, there's a recall value to the name. Now, as we go ahead, Dr. Shipma, I want to understand a little about, you know, was your background always defense that you started on a defense startup or how did the idea germinate? Okay. So my actually have uh, almost zero background in defense, except for, let's say, uh, panache for technology and uh, interest in uh, defense or, or a sense of patriotism that has always been there from uh, much younger ages. Uh, I did my uh, master's in nanotech and PhD in nanomagnetism. Uh, did a year of postdoc at University of Western Australia as uh, uh, working on hepatic cancer. So I've had a uh, little bit of experience across the domains in various engineering and engineering related fields and applied uh, magnetism as we call it. Uh, post my uh, postdoc, I started my first company. It was an edtech venture, uh, edtech venture. It was before the Baijus of the world and the current uh, uh, explosion of this entire education uh, uh, startup space. We started the company in 2008 and we, we were actually building research incubators in the country. So we used to work with universities, we used to work with educational institutions to in, inculcate research as a part of the academic uh, curriculum uh, to make sure that every student that passes through the Indian education system has research problem solving as a part of their curriculum and not an, as an extracurricular activity that they could do. Right. So we wanted to move from the rote learning space to the uh, research problem solving space. We're very successful. We started with small private universities. At one point, we were working with IIT, BHU and IMs, etc. Uh, we were semi-acquired by a larger education conglomerate and we went through an IPO in 2017, uh, successfully listed in BSc and NSC. And after the IPO is when I took the exit. So. Then there was like a two, three months of break, travel the world, spent at least part of the money that I had earned. Then I realized that, you know what, as much as I kept talking about retirement and taking an easy life, uh, you know, I was probably too young for it and uh, things were not okay. So then we decided that, or when I say we, I and my partner Praveen, we decided that we'll start something new and we were scouting out for what will be good areas to work in. For us, defense was a very good strategic fit. Uh, we were very good at doing uh, extremely frugal R&D. Uh, defense was by definition a long-term game. We had made the money in the first startup, so we had no reason uh, to take home a salary or we were not in a hurry to make this a success. So we knew that we had the staying power for the next five, 10 years. And that's one of the things that's been built into the culture of uh, Big Bang Boom. We are extremely thrifty in terms of spending money. We, we, we love spending money on our people and on uh, important uh, research, etc. But let's say on infrastructure, let's say salaries to promoters, we, we, we don't pay a dime out. And that has allowed us to stay healthy financially over the last three years of doing the R&D. And we, we have something internally that we call an infinity runway, saying that if nothing goes our way, we don't pick up an order, we are not successful in our product development. We have the capacity to survive the next 10, 20 years. And in defense, that is very, very important. Right. So the, the staying power was an entire, uh, important factor in our decision making. Uh, Praveen comes from a defense background. Both his parents are from HAL. Uh, I have a passion towards making uh, defense weapon systems, etc. And the defense field is very similar to education. It's a, a field that's primarily controlled by the government and regulation. It's opaque. It has been resistant to change for the last 70 years of Indian uh, independence. And since we were successful in uh, making a mark in education, we felt that defense could be a uh, attractive area. Well, that's actually a great journey, a huh? wonderful story, actually. So, which uh, very clearly tells uh, the world that you need not have a defense background to be successful in one of the defense ventures. And uh, as we proceed, what was your first project with the defense? How did you actually get it? And uh, what was that? That's actually a very, very interesting uh, story. Our first project uh, that we started off in Big Bang Boom was not in India at all. We worked with a student of mine who was in uh, South Korea at the time and his uh, partner there. We had submitted a proposal to the DAPA challenge, the Defense Acquisition and Procurement Agency, which is the 
equivalent to the Ministry of Defense in uh, South Korea for uh, adapting some of the technologies that were currently being owned by the South Korean army into usable uh, products. So we had picked up a drone and a, a, a diagnostic device solution that they had patented. And we created an autonomous environmental monitoring drone. Uh, this was uh, selected as one of the top innovations in South Korea. We received an award from uh, President Moon for that. And uh, this obviously had flashed up on Twitter and a uh, number of social media, etc. Uh, then on Twitter, I got a ping from uh, our current defense secretary, Dr. Rajay Kumar. He, he was secretary of defense protection then. So he pinged me on Twitter saying, Dr. Shiva, this is fantastic, but why are you not? I see that you're an Indian. Why are you not working with Indian defense? I said, sir, I would love to. And I replied to him back on DM saying that, sir, I would love to, but I have no idea how to start. He's like, why don't you come down and meet us? And then that turned into a, a meeting with uh, the DevSec. Then he came out with, uh, he had explained to us as to what are the initiatives that they are working with on startups. And at that time, IDEX was just going to be announced. It was just around the corner, two, three months away from uh, a formal launch. He had given us an insight into uh, this program. And uh, we, we just thought it sounds fantastic. Bro. So we, we thought, okay, if there is a platform where they are going to get uh, startups involved. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like it's perfect time for us. So just a very basic uh, information, which I wanted uh, to understand was that, uh, are you just designing and are you just developing or is manufacturing also a part of it? Manufacturing is actually a big part of it. So what we do right now is that uh, we do a lot of the design in-house for sure. Uh, we also do a lot of assembly. Uh, so what, what Big Bang Boom does per se is that we build solutions for problems. So, so we don't look at building components or LRUs as we call it in defense. We look at trying to see if we can solve a problem statement that's being put out by the uh, armed forces. So it could be something as simple as... Uh, an army officer calling us and telling us, you know, I'm struggling to get my vehicles operational at the height of winter or, you know, my guys are feeling really cold and the current uh, uh, warm clothes are not working for us. Or, and it could be as complicated as saying that, you know, what our tanks are just not able to navigate through the night. So is there a way we can retrofit them with uh, day and night vision and ca can we put a strategic uh, uh, AI based vision system on top of them? Uh, so you, we take the problem, we split it into what are the technologies that are uh, involved in it, what are the technologies that need to be integrated to be able to successfully deliver on this project. Uh, then we start developing, we identify, the we split the components of the problem statement or the solution architecture as we call it into three parts. Things that are the core of the entire solution. These are things that we build in-house and we develop capabilities in and we keep the IP extremely protected and guarded. Then things that are critical that are available in the Indian ecosystems. These are things that we we'll either customize that when I say customize, it means we build the design and we outsource or we may outsource the entire component to them. If there are more than five, six players already in that domain, let's say, for example, high DBI antennas, there are already six companies in India. There are around 120 companies in the world. So we don't look at getting into making antennas asses because there are enough people doing it. So, if we if antennas are available off the shelf that we like, we pick them up, or we will work with one of the startups to de design a customized antenna for our requirement. Then the third part of it is basically to put all of this together, which can either happen in the form of a manufacturing or an assembly setup, depending on the product. Assembly usually we do it in house. Manufacturing, mechanical uh, mechanical manufacturing is currently outsourced. But then in the long term, once we pick up our orders, we are intending that this entire thing becomes uh, in house because while R&D is fantastic, design is fantastic, the manufacturing is basically what gives us a scale to be a very large company. And we are very, very, uh, uh, very cognizant of this fact. And we are very keen that we want to get into it sooner or later. You know, uh, when we talk of this, uh, it, it's a great idea, you know, that at some time you do want to start manufacturing. But what I want to basically understand also is that uh, have you identified on a supply chain management for the sort of projects you have? Because one day any one of them comes ahead, then you already have, a, have an existing uh, chain. So uh, have you identified something like that? Absolutely. So what we basically do is that we take the product to for each product that we are talking about through a life cycle. 
usually what happens is we build what is known as a POC first, a, a proof of concept. We show it to the armed forces, we get it vetted. We also verify the end user's uh, requirement and the use case of it. Based on the POC, we usually look at grants and that's one of the reasons these awards are very, very critical to our business model. Where we look at either the Ministry of Defense or the Science and Technology or the Department of Biotech, actually funding the projects that we are starting off. We are very clear that we don't invest all the money that is required in R&D space. We look at a subsidized R&D approach. We also use the connections that we have with uh, educational institutions. Uh, to further subsidize it by using infrastructure that's available around the country. Given our background from edtech, uh, we have access to around 20, 30 universities in the uh, this thing at, in the country, and that cumulatively gives us access to almost thousand crores of infrastructure, which we can use either at cost or on a relationship basis. Uh, once we do that, once the POC uh, has been built and uh, you know, the end users requirements have been vetted. Then we start building what is known as the military grade prototype. To, to this, uh, this entire phase, starting from ideation to prototyping, testing and trials, we don't look at supply chain at all. We primarily look at building a very high quality product and we don't look at multiple vendors for any of the uh, thing. We try to pick up the best vendor possible. But once the product enters the prototyping, has completed the prototyping stage and has entered the trial stage, the trials typically, like for example, our anti-drone system, we've been doing trials for the last eight, nine months. And we have recently completed what is known as UTRR process with their model. So it takes around eight to nine months. During this eight to nine months, we start building the supply chain that's required. So when, when I talk about supply chain, it could be multiple vendors for manufacturing, building up the internal, uh, let's say the equipments. And like, for example, uh, today we no longer buy carbon fiber boards. We have now backward integrated into carbon fibers. We actually buy the raw fibers. We have a in-house uh, weaving machine. We have a in-house uh, molding machine that makes carbon fiber plates and then we laser cut them into the shapes and sizes that we want. So as this product progresses, we backward integrate into the supply chain where we are interested and where we are not interested in doing the manufacturing or the production part ourselves, we work with multiple vendors. Like for example, our see-through armor has finished trials uh, uh, around four months back and the initial prototypes were built by a very good manufacturing firm in Chennai. Right now, we have signed up with four firms. All of them are better the design. We have given them sample pieces to manufacture, etc., to test whether each one of them will be able to build to a quality that we are expecting and at the cost prices, uh, price points that we are interested in. So as we finish the prototype development and we go through the trials, we start building the supply chain over a period of time. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for these DIO projects, have you got a confirmed order from the MOD? No, not at the moment. There is, uh, there has been uh, a, a significant amount of deliberation on this. There are, uh, from what has been aware, the AON process has already been started. AON approval is pending. The minute the AON approval comes through, the RFP should be floated. Post RFP is when the confirmed order will uh, is expected to come through. But currently, it looks very good, both for our see-through armor and the anti-drone system, the two products that we have been working on uh, over the last two years. Both the end user, uh, the line directorate, as they call, call it, both of them have shown a uh, significant interest in taking the product forward to procurement. And uh, I think the price negotiations have gone on. We have given indicative pricing, etc. So things are moving. So it looks like in the next three to six months, things should be really uh, exciting for us. Right. And what about the, you know, the CRPF and the BSF projects? Uh, so CRPF project is basically has not moved much. We did an initial prototype for them, primarily on the wound healing system. This was a very, very interesting project for us because it allowed us to get a, get away from the electromechanical uh, nature of most of our projects and work on a wound healing solution. So we had built up a, a small thermo, uh, thermosensitive polymer-based system uh, that could be where we could load a blood clotting agent, uh, a painkiller, analgesic, and, uh, and an artificial skinning uh, component. So if a soldier gets injured on the battlefield, it could be a small deodorant bottle kind of a thing that the gentleman could take and spray. And he or she would get covered with artificial skin while an antiseptic and an analgesic is directly injected onto the bloodstream, thereby significantly cutting down the blood loss and reducing pain and providing access for uh, first aid uh, as soon as possible. 
the product was tested. We take we gave them a few samples. Uh, they are yet to get back beyond that. So CRPF has been a little uh, slow in the uptake. BSF has been actually going good. They have engaged with us quite a bit. After the initial round of success that we had, they invited us to Jammu to show a demonstration, which we did. Then around a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks back, we had done a full-fledged deployment in uh, on the western border where we deployed our system for over uh, two to three weeks time. And it was used on a 24-hour basis by the BSF forces, thereby giving us a lot of learnings and data points for us to capture and them a lot of experience with our system. We are ideally expecting that in the next two, three months, they also move forward with a, a process that is very similar to IDEX. See, the difference between the two is that IDEX has already done the background. BIO has already done the background work. They have they have brought in a procurement policy uh, under uh, Chapter 2 of the DAP 2020. IDEX is uh, one of the mechanisms through which they can procure. There are provisions already in place for single, single vendor approach and how is it that limited tenders can be released, etc. BSF at the moment do, does not have it. But I have also got news that the MHA has engaged with MOD to understand how they have built this entire uh, development and procurement processes. And they are hoping to probably create a version of the same themselves. Absolutely. Now, one thing which is very important to understand here is that you are, for some projects like the ballistic bulletproof armor, uh, with uh, in competition with a lot of already established companies. There is an already existing ecosystem in India for it. So what I wanted to understand was, how will you fit yourself into this ecosystem? Actually, uh, the way we look at it is that if we are in competition with an existing ecosystem, we usually don't get into the project at all in the first place. So even in the ballistic armor materials that we're talking about, what we are working on is a next generation, extremely light, uh, a super, uh, let's say an upgraded version of the current tech that is available. The current tech that India uses and is produced by probably three or four major players in India is what is known as boron carbide armor for grade three and grade four threats. Uh, this is good. It's a ceramic based material, but the technology has been around for the last 20 years. Uh, right. And the weight of this particular body armor for the entire uh, for an entire body armor, for entire for, for the full body armor, is around somewhere between seven to ten kgs, and that becomes very very hard for soldiers to use in the long run. So we have come up with a new material that's modified using nanotech that significantly reduces the weight by almost 30 40 percent while retaining the stopping power, as we call it. Uh, we have done the initial trials at uh, GFSU. We've got good feedback, etc., and we have actually signed up. Uh, uh, co-development or co-production uh, MOUs with the top players existing. So if you take the body armor uh, space in India, you list the top one, two, three players. There are two players who have already signed up with Bitpaco. So our idea for this kind of a space where we are developing on an existing market is that we will build a superior product and then we'll work with the guys who are existingly manufacturing it. That way, I don't have to set up another manufacturing phase. I'm not their competitor, but I am more of a technology partner for this kind of com this companies. But that's a nice idea, actually. And uh, as we progress, you know, uh, into the interview, drones are something which actually attract attention of everybody today. Now, whatever development, you know, we've been seeing so much of them, swarm drones, since that, you know, we had Republic Day, saw such a beautiful, uh, you know, Rajpath was, skies were just some wonderment, absolutely. <laughs> and with all that, the world, you know, the country is also very, very, you know, focused and, and drone uh, is a signature of all eyes as an activity and as a technology. Now, to understand one fact, that with this, there was also a concept of a dual use technology very majorly in drones. So what you are conceptualizing, will it be for a dual use or will it be totally military? Actually, this is a very, very interesting question because not only the drones, literally every uh, product that we build, whether it's the see-through armor, the anti-drone system, we, we have a very high focus on uh, dual use technologies uh, because not because we are not interested in defense or something, Primarily because of the fact that we believe that defense as a business requires that level of de-risking, right? Given that we have a classic single vendor, uh, single client problem, uh, 
uh, I need to look at a way where in the future, if there is a contingency, I can de-risk the business by uh, adapting the same set of technologies to different uh, use cases. So we do that with every product that we have, not just with drones. In fact, uh, the exoskeleton is a perfect example of something like this, where the the primary use case is actually rehabilitation of patients with lower limb injuries. And the secondary use case is in military applications for low carrying, uh, improved uh, endurance and, uh, you know, improved mobility, etc. Uh, coming to the drones, on, but as drones as a project primarily, we are looking at, we are looking at dual use. But we are not looking at the typical most popular of the use cases that are there today, such as the agriculture drone, etc. Primarily because that we we primarily because we again feel that's a very crowded market. There are already players in the market who have been who started before us. Like there are p- people who had the foresight, and they started probably five six years before, and they have come to a significant level of maturity today. To us to compete with them, I wouldn't say is impossible, but I don't think that's where the forte is, and that's where we want to spend our time and efforts on. So what we do is we pick up very niche areas of uh, drone technology, and we try to focus on that. Uh, we are currently working with the army on an extremely small surveillance drone that's uh, less than 50 grams in uh, weight. We're looking at drones that can be integrated with rocket launchers and uh, UBGLs, grenade launchers, etc., thereby converting drones into smarter munitions, etc. Uh, we're also using our surveillance drone project that we are using to build what is known as a urban safety drone, right? Like today, uh, Uber, Ola have become very, very popular. And uh, in, in principle, it's called a ride hailing service, saying that on demand, I'll be able to get a car or a cab wherever I am to travel to a place. This didn't used to be the case, let's say, five, six years back when we used to book a fast track or we need to, we need to do pre-booking sometimes one day in advance to be able to get a cab, right? So that's reduced to four, five minutes now. And people get frustrated if it takes more than 15 minutes to get a cab. Uh, similarly, if you look at it, uh, when we come to urban environment, security is a huge concern. And uh, there is uh, a, there are there have been studies that have been done saying that crimes in urban environments, especially crimes against women, are more opportunity crimes rather than premeditated crimes, right? Uh, and usually, an assault or a crime happens because the assailant or the criminal believes he can get away with it. The lot there will be a lot less people who will engage in uh, activities if they had the fear that they'll get caught. Not that they don't trust the police or the system. They just believe that there is no evidence for it. There's no way the police will be able to zero in on them and catch them, given the fact that there are so much more crimes compared to the number of officers that are there. Uh, Which is also evident in the fact that any areas that are covered by CCTV, uh, be it metro stations or malls, office complexes, the crime reduces significantly. I'm not saying there's no crime, but it reduces significantly. So there's been a thought in our mind that if we are able to provide security on demand using autonomous drones, where let's say uh, let's say anybody, let's say it's either me or uh, my friend who feels unsafe today, if I could get a autonomous drone to provide a live CCTV footage of myself to my company, to my boyfriend, to my uh, uh, father, to my brother, to my security agency, the local police stations, suddenly areas that currently we don't have cctv infrastructure we don't have police cameras that are being used for monitoring can come under the ambit of this dynamic uh, drone net that we can create so the autonomous drone tech that's required for it we are already building under the military use case we have already we have started working with both the government of tamil nadu and the telangana to explore if we can do like a pilot study with these drones in a particular urban not probably the entire city maybe a, a small corridor etc they're actually quite forthcoming and we are quite excited about that prospect. And then we believe that that can completely change the way security works around the country. If we are able to provide, let's say, you're feeling unsafe today for whatever reason, right? Uh, you are able to click an app and in five minutes, there's a drone that's coming there with a CCTV camera. The drone can also be used as a deterrent. Like there can be alarm systems. There can be flashy uh, lights that are put onto the drone. We can even integrate it with a small pepper spray, thereby providing both security and safety Uh, at a click or a button at a cost as low as a few hundred rupees. So these are kind of things that we are very, very interested in working on. That's wonderful. Actually, what a wonderful idea, you know, because women's safety is a very important factor. And all said and done, you know, it is a factor which needs to be looked into. I think it would be a wonderful thing to project these sort of projects to the world, you know. People should know that such sort of a thing can happen. And so it's it's, it's virtually wonderful. 
And uh, now, you know, going ahead with a little bit of history from your end, uh, which were the two projects at IDEX uh, which won you those accolades? Sure. Uh, the first project was a see-through armor. See-through armor is basically a situational awareness upgrade for armored vehicles. Currently, if you look at it, armored vehicles, uh, if you take the BMP2, for example, has a commander, a driver, and a gunner. Each one of them have multiple periscopes. Periscopes are these glass uh, uh, visibility holes that are available, which are 60 degrees by 40 degrees. So imagine a very small glass middle through which you can look out and see what is happening. So the commander, the driver, gunner, all of them are dependent on these very, very small holes to be able to see what is going on, where to drive, what are the weapon systems around, are there any enemy vehicles, etc. This is extremely uh, uh, frustrating in today's world when there is no need for such restrictions. See, this was these are systems that were made 40, 50 years before the designs were built. And there's currently no need for them to use this kind of an outdated technology. There's also an issue that because of the fact that they use these uh, glass periscopes, the they have absolutely zero night vision. So the uh, entire armored vehicle uh, uh, capacity of India, which is significant uh, power, while it has some ability to move around in the night, it has almost almost negligible uh, uh, ability in terms of long range movement, driver feedback, uh, thermal vision, thermal engagement, etc. So we were asked to build a situational awareness upgrade, which will provide a 360 degree view from all sides, uh, which are which is uh, you know very intuitive in nature that can provide both day and night feed on demand, and also integrate any of the new age technologies on top of it. So we built that. We put an AI layer on top of it that gives feedback to the commander on whether there's the person in the vicinity or a vehicle. If it's a vehicle, it's a friend or a foe, uh, things like that. And we are also looking at a way where this entire image can be stitched together and provided on top of what is known as an augmented reality glass. It's very similar to these MR glasses that people wear these days. And so the entire feedback comes on top of a single display device. And that makes it a lot easier. So we track the motion. So if the driver is looking left, the commander is looking right. They will see respectively what, uh, you know, which direction they are facing, which is the reason it's called see-through armor. Armor is the armored vehicle. And we are in principle looking at a way where the people can see through the armored vehicle and have a vision system that, that makes it feel like they are on the outside. They are not inside a completely enclosed space. That was the first project. The second project and probably one that is very much in demand now is the anti-drone system. And given the threat that has been there around the country, around the world, uh, anti-drone systems have become very, very essential to a country safety. So we were asked to build an anti-drone system that can detect and neutralize threats at a five kilometer uh, radius uh, and uh, neutralize them at a one kilometer uh, kind of a distance. We've managed to build one of the best systems, not only in the India, but around the world. Uh, we build systems that can detect threats 10, 15 kilometers away and neutralize them at that uh, range thereby giving us significant strategic advantages, especially uh, in places where there is things such as uh, LACs and LOCs where, you know, your uh, the neutral zone itself extends over 10 kilometers. So there's a requirement for you to be able to operate from across the border. So we built it. We've done demonstrations of this around the country. We have worked with the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, BSF, uh, et cetera, on this. We've done extensive trials for uh, Indian Air Force in Pokhran and at uh, Babina. So we've done, we've got very, very good feedback on the anti-drone system. So these are the two projects that we picked up under uh, the ITEX to begin with. And currently we are also the only startup that has finished two user trials. So both the products are completed, the user trials are done, and we are on track for hopefully procurement soon. Wonderful. And we really wish you all the best for it, actually. And, uh, you know, now when, the, as we move towards wrapping up the show, we'd like to ask you one question, which I always, you know, uh, it's in the back of my mind with anybody who started a business. Uh, there is a short-term plan uh, and there's a long-term plan. Now, short-term plan, we've understood. What is the long-term plan? Does, do exports fit into your long-term plan, especially for the third world nations, especially for nations uh, in the continents of Africa and South America and uh, Asia? Uh, because, you know, we always talk of exports in these regions. You know, they are high growth potential regions. So do you have a plan? Have you chalked up something for yourself? Absolutely. So, in fact, we already have uh, uh, our uh, marketing arms, etc. outside the country. Uh, for example, in UAE, we are represented by Alhamra. 
Uh, we have a partnership with them. Alhambra is one of the biggest companies in UAE, part of the Edge Group. It's a government-owned entity. So we have looked at using our STA system along with their Rapdan systems and try to build up a, a POC for the UAE army. We also have agents in uh, three countries in Africa. We have our own uh, employee who sits out of the uh, UK now. And we have started engaging with uh, countries such as Mauritius, M Maldives and Sri Lanka with their respective defense attaches and the, this thing. Uh, and their defense uh, department. So export is a very, very important part of our uh, culture. And it's also very important to know that IDEX, the MOD also encourages exports because India has now realized as much as, you know, we develop technologies for in-house use and we indigenize it. It is also important to export it because that gives us a negotiating power when it comes to diplomacy, etc. So our ability to provide security and uh, and uh, uh, defense technologies to other countries puts India at a better, more strategically sound footing than where India is today. So there is a significant uh, uh, encouragement. In fact, some of the meetings with like the Sultanate of Women, etc., was actually set up by MOD for us. So defense, uh, defense export definitely plays a huge role in it. But then we still believe that the first big order will come from India, right? Uh, it's only after being able to pick up an order and executing it in India will be, be able to scale significantly around the world. That is something that we are conscious of. But then uh, we have also engaged with the uh, Ministry of External Affairs. We realize that India provides uh, credit lines to a lot of countries. And a lot of these credit lines for the want of operationalization or the, uh, the, the process and documentation surrounding it are lying unutilized uh, at this point of time. So we are working with uh, MEA on that and trying to figure out if we can use the credit line that India is offering to actually provide security or at least defensive uh, equipment to foreign countries. So that's something that's going on. So we are quite excited about the export opportunities. Uh, our long-term plan per se is to be able to continue doing what we do best and build a, a large portfolio of products, right? Like we are very keen that we don't want to be, become a one-trick pony. Like even if you see right now, we are looking at a see-through armor, which is meant for the armored vehicles, for the infantry, for the artillery division. We have built an anti-drone for the Air Force. We are building the exoskeleton for the infantry. So both in terms of which armed forces that we target, what is the product, product we look at diversification at every uh, step of the way. And our product technology pipeline that we have today is that we have started working on three, four other projects. And we expect that we'll be able to bring one product, uh, two trials and one product to commercialization every year going forward. So in a period of the next four to five years, that should give us at least five, six products that we are in a position to sell. And each product should have uh, at least a, a thousand crore kind of a potential, which means that if one of these products succeeds, then you have a, a unicorn in your hands. And that's, that's the kind of uh, approach with which we are going forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva. That was wonderful. You know, it's so rarely that you get to hear such focused, uh, you know, interviews from uh, people who've entered the field trying to establish established uh, to a certain extent but having such great ideas you know it's it's a very great feeling because this is the youth of the country and we always felt you know it was a very good clarion call by the prime minister when he said that everybody need not go to work in the office do something for yourself. Why do something for others always? Which is a wonderful feeling. So, sir, I think uh, you really, I, when, when the audience hears it, you've made that day. The younger generation will be extremely happy. The senior generation like me will feel that it's never too late. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, with uh, this nice smile, we go back to Chitali who's waiting for us in, um, uh, you know, in her area, which is the Mediterranean. We just hope you have an export market in the Mediterranean Sea region. And, uh, you know, they are also small countries, expanding nations, looking forward to good but cheaper solutions. And uh, she's in Cyprus and we take you back to the studios there, Chitali. You really have a good story in your hand. Exactly, ma'am. That's true. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. As the company name suggested, Big Bang Boom. Yes, you guys are too much energetic and there's so many things you are doing together. It was really wonderful. Um, I was hearing all the things that you, your company is doing, the products and everything. It was, it was really good to hear all that. And uh, we hope to meet you not virtually, personally as well, sometime soon and take an interview. Thank you so much for giving your time to us today. And uh, Adi wishes you ADU wishes your company a very best for the future ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks, ma'am.
Thank you, Shadari. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Thank you.